Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on the offshore energy applications uh, one. Uh, my name is uh, Olimpo Anayalara. Uh, I am a professor uh, in electrical energy systems at the University of Strathclyde. And uh, I have uh, the honor of uh, chairing this session today. Uh, we have uh, uh, four very interesting presentations. Uh, these presentations will be delivered by, by, by speakers. And uh, the topics uh, cover uh, many, many very relevant issues uh, that need to be addressed in order to achieve uh, uh, the climate targets, you know? So as you know, we are in a, 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 a very a challenging times because we need to hurry uh, to generate knowledge and innovation in a number of areas, you know, to, to help addressing the, the climate issues. So for today, we are going to uh, talk about uh, offshore wind, which is a, a, a central uh, element uh, in the energy transition. And uh, uh, today is in the context of how uh, uh, offshore wind uh, can generate uh, hydrogen and how can this uh, increase uh, er energy security, you know, in, uh, in Scotland, in UK, in Europe. And uh, in the context of hydrogen, we will also talk about how we can store uh, uh, hydrogen efficiently. Uh, we have a very interesting presentation today about uh, assessing uh, uh, onshore wind resource in Scotland. You know, at the moment, uh, the trend is looking towards offshore, but uh, we know that in Scotland, we have very good, very good wind resource. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what a uh, 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 Stephanie is going to, to, to tell us about. And of course, we, we have the, the first presentation by uh, Arun, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, modeling uh, uh, techniques to understand the wave, uh, the wave resource. So uh, my first presentation today is then by uh, Arun Kumar uh, from the University of uh, uh, Dundee. Uh, Arun, if you are ready, then I will, I will be happy to, to stop here and, and give you the floor. Uh, if that is okay, Brenda, please. Yes. Um, so th thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anayalara. And thank you, ETP, for the opportunity to present at the conference uh, this year. Uh, my name is Arun Kumar. I am a PhD student at the University of Dundee. I'm working under the supervision of Dr. Masood Hayat Um And I'll be talking briefly about a part of my uh, a portion of the PhD project that I've uh, been working on for the, for the last uh, year or so. It's, it deals with uh, nonlinear wave current interaction. So I'll just uh, go over a brief introduction and then uh, talk about the numerical wave current tank setup that I have used in, in my project. Uh, I'll move on to talk about some comparisons with experiments and simulations, uh, discuss some wave current cases that I have uh, simulated and then um, uh, that will lead to the results and discussions of, of what I've found from the study so far. So just a, a brief um, uh, uh, outline of, of why, what my PhD uh, consists of. So it's a, it's a, the project it essentially deals with interaction of waves, currents, and winds with floating structures, um, uh, deep water floating structures specifically. Uh, the effect of, uh, and, and in this particular uh, part of, of, of the PhD, I'm uh, focusing on the effect of currents on waves in deep and intermediate waters. Uh, I'm using all the open source uh, CFD uh, toolbox open form to run the uh, computations, uh, to run the simulations. And um, I have, I had previously generated a, a, a wave tank uh, that, that uh, uh, generates uh, waves. And I had studied the interaction of the set waves with a fixed body, a float, freely floating body, and a moored body. All of these were two dimensional 2D simulations. So I had done those. And now what I've done is I've incorporated current into, into, the, uh, into the wave tank. And uh, the study that I've done is a, it is a qualitative evaluation of the more of how the current modifies the wave parameters, specifically the change in wave height due to the presence of current, change in wave length, how surface elevation changes, and how the current affects the pressure and horizontal particle velocity. So uh, when it comes to the numerical wave tank setup uh, in CFD, so the wave tank, as I mentioned, was generated, and I looked into the interaction of waves with fixed and floating structures. And then the next part was to study the reflection coefficient in the domain. So uh, as the uh, so the, there is uh, the, on the at the bottom we see the essentially the numerical wave domain. So on the uh, left is the inlet relaxation zone. The wave is generated in this uh, zone, 
And at the right is the outlet relaxation zone. The wave gets absorbed uh, at the outlet relaxation zone. However, um, uh, th there, there could be uh, reflections in the domain uh, due to uh, nu uh, numerical instabilities or, or uh, due to uh, improper relaxation. So uh, it was essential to study how well uh, the relaxation works. So I, uh, I had done the relaxation study by uh, you know, using a two ga a wave gauge method. I put two wave gauges and I looked at the relaxation. Um, the, uh, or I, I looked at the reflection, I'm sorry. Uh, I looked at the reflection from the uh, outlet relaxation zone. And then once I had finalized what my wave tank, ideal wave tank should be, I moved on to adding the current, which was done by a linear superposition of the current uh, velocity over the wave velocity. So it's, it's essentially a summation of the two as shown here. So moving to the um, uh, the reflection study that I mentioned, I uh, I calculated the reflection coefficient for three different wave domains. So if I quickly hop back to the previous slides, outlet relaxation zone, the length of this zone is something that I was um, uh, I had to decide what should be an ideal length. So I varied it f f uh, uh, in um, uh, in three different cases. So one was uh, a, a, an outlet relaxation zone of 0.5 lambda, an outlet relaxation zone of 0.75 lambda, and an outlet relaxation zone of uh, length lambda. And as you can see, the, the one with 0.75 lambda has the lowest reflection. And uh, this led me to believe that this, uh, this would be the most um, ideal uh, size of, of the outlet relaxation zone which leads me to the the the, uh, the finalized uh, um, wave relaxation zone so this is a schematic of the numerical wave uh, tank with all the, with the location of all the sensors so i have three wave gauges in the domain and i have uh, velocity and pressure sensors at three three different water depths at the sea floor at two thirds the water depth and about one third of the water depth so at three different pardon me uh, at three different uh, water depths i am uh, sensing um, the the pressure and the velocity uh, the, as I mentioned, the wave is generated on, in the inlet relaxation zone and it is absorbed in the outlet relaxation zone. And when it comes to uh, introducing the current, uh, how open foam, how, how the numerical uh, system works is that whatever current I add on the inlet, I, I need to take that out so that the flux um, is, is constant. So there is no loss or uh, gain of uh, fluid from the domain. So that's how I, so uh, the, whatever changes I make to the wave velocity by linear superposition on the inlet, I have to take that out on the outlet. So that's another um, thing that I um, realized on, on the on course of um, developing the numerical wave tank. So once the wave uh, numerical wave current tank was uh, was ready, I um, I uh, looked at other um, uh, experimental and numerical studies where uh, they have looked at um, uh, a wave in deep water with um, uh, a, a uniform current of uh, um, of uh, said magnitude. These are non-dimensionalized values with water depth. So yeah, it was a uniform current. I uh, and as you can see, stream. Uh, th there were two possibilities for me to implement this in in, uh, in open foam. One was to use stream function, which is um, the stream function wave theory that comes uh, as a default in 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 waves to foam. Uh, in waves to foam. Uh, and I could add a current on top of that. So I did that. And I also did the li linear superposition, which I mentioned previously, which was the summation of the current velocity with the wave velocity. So both the results are, are quite like, it, they're quite on top of each other. And they agree well with the simulations of Zhang et al. And, and the experimental results from Umeyama as well. So uh, this this gave me some confidence as to um, uh, the, the, the functionality of, of the wave current domain. And uh, that led to the study. Uh, so essentially, here I have um, I have five different wave cases, and uh, the water depth is maintained constant at point, point 0 0.7 meters. Uh, and the and the other parameters of the wave, such as the wave period and the height uh, and wavelength, are, are uh, uh, modified or they are they are systematically changed to uh, move uh, between deep and intermediate water cases. So there is also a, a, a pattern that I follow. So for waves uh, W1, W2, W3, you know, the first three waves, it, it, these have a constant wave length. And uh, the wave height changes by a factor of 2.5. And for wave 2, wave 4, and wave 5, uh, they have a constant uh, wave height. 0.036 and the wavelength changes by a factor of photo the the reason i do this is because uh, this way i can i can keep one of the parameters constant and um, uh, have the wave interact with different currents and see how uh, wavelength I, I can isolate one of the parameters and look at how wavelength affects the uh, how wavelength affects the interaction between waves and currents or how wave height affects the interaction between waves and currents 
So once the wave uh, cases that I would be simulating were finalized, uh, the next uh, part of the uh, study was to, uh, to decide what currents I would be using. So for this, I uh, turned to the um, various oceanographic studies uh, available in, um, in, in the current literature. So these are different um, uh, experimental uh, and measured uh, velocities of, of uh, deep water currents in, in at the, all these different sites at, in the South, uh, South China Sea, Ferro Shetland Channel, offshore Brazil. So I looked at the, the, gen the profile of the currents that are generally observed in, in deep water oceans and and I've plotted all of them on, on, on top, um, in, um, in non-dimensionalized quantities. And then that gave me an idea of what the profile. So then, then I selected three different points of these three points, I hope you can see the laser pointer. Oh, three. So three different points of water depths and three different surface velocities. And this gave me a total of nine cases. Uh, 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 nine current conditions, and these these are all following currents. Uh, so they are in the positive x direction. So they are all following currents. I, if you can, if we consider the negative uh, opposing current as well, that uh, uh, gives me a total of eighteen current profiles. So then I, I study, uh, I look at the interaction of the five uh, waves mentioned above with the eighteen current profiles that I've uh, mentioned here, and then I look at the the, the results. So the first thing that I obviously went for was the surface elevation. So this is at gauge one from the wave domain. So it, this is the gauge at uh, a distance of lambda from the uh, from the inlet relaxation zone. So about one wavelength from the inlet relaxation zone. That's where this wave gauges. And uh, we clearly see I have taken here the, as an example. I've taken cases W1, W2, W3. So the wavelengths are constant and the wave heights are uh, changing by a magnitude of uh, 2.5. And uh, we see that an opposing current has a more pronounced Pronounced effect on the on the on the wave uh, on the surface elevation of the wave and then uh, and a, a following current uh, and the similar results are observed and so then I take a look at the wavelength uh, so here the the parameter lambda prime or lambda dash is uh, uh, it's uh, it's the change in wavelength so I I, I I obtain the wavelength of the wave um, when as it interacts with the current. And then I uh, compare that with the uh, case uh, uh, when the when there is no current. So and and uh, so it, it, this is a percentage increase or, or decrease uh, is is uh, plotted on 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 this particular chart. So again, we see that when it comes to um, change in wavelength for different, uh, this is the a, a certain velocity of the current, but the depth of profile uh, depth of change is is, uh, is uh, uh, altering along the x-axis. So we see that there is a slight opening, or uh, as as the depth of um, uh, profile changes, uh, or as we go uh, deeper uh, to the uh, sea floor, we see that uh, the change in wavelength is is larger. Also, we see another pattern is that uh, following currents uh, uh, tends to increase, uh, while opposing currents tend to decrease with uh, with uh, the change in pro current profile. Uh, the same study was repeated for wave change in wave height, how the change, wave height is being modified. So again, we see that the the, the, the sort of diverging cone shape that we uh, saw in the in the wavelength case as well is it's again uh, as visible here, which again indicates that um, uh, as the profile uh, changes, as we get closer to the sea uh, floor, uh, the the effects of of current get more um, pronounced um, on on both uh, following and opposing currents. Uh, this is taken at um, a water depth of uh, 0.33. So one third of the uh, entire water depth, one third from the uh, free surface, that is. And uh, we see again that um, uh, the, the, in case of a following current, there is an increase in pressure. And in case of an opposing current, there's a decrease in pressure and has a, has a more pronounced effect. Um, and finally, I, I take a look at the uh, horizontal particle velocity, the one that I'm essentially modifying in the wave theory. So exactly the same scenario, the same sensor, uh, a velocity sensor. And we see that, again, the, the in case of following current, there's an increment in, in, in the velocity, which is expected. And in case of an opposing current, uh, the velocity decreases. 
So this is where I'm at, and uh, uh, so the, the, uh, the, this is uh, I have uh, looked into more uh, in in more depth uh, 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 into the, the the different results. Uh, I've compared uh, the same parameter. I've kept the wavelength constant and and uh, looked at how the wave height changes and those uh, things. I, I've not included the results here, but that's uh, that's essentially the study that I've done. And now I, I'm planning to do the same for shallow water um, uh, waves in in and uh, using conoidal wave theory. And then include uh, again as I, I already have done the wave interaction with fixed floating and mood structure. So next step would be to uh, repeat the same fixed uh, floating and mood structure interaction with wave uh, with wave current system in the in the wave current domain. And uh, after that, I would incorporate uh, wind into the numerical domain, and then the entire like implement the entire uh, model of, of wave current wind interaction with floating structures. Uh, so that's all I have for now, and um, thank you and. I'd love to answer some questions if you have any. Thank you. <clears throat> from from the audience, I see uh, I see some names here with us. So. Uh, any questions from the from the audience? <clears throat> I believe uh, they can uh, uh, unmute themselves, right, Brenda, and ask the questions, so they can use the discussion forum. They need to type their questions into the discussion forum. Okay, um, okay, yeah. right. So I, I see no questions at the moment uh, in the discussion forum. Uh, but uh, I will give a bit of time uh, if, if anybody wants to ask. But uh, I, I will start with a very simple question, Arun. Uh, perhaps you discussed this in your presentation, yes. but I, I, I missed it maybe. Uh, you know that we, we obviously a lot of, a lot of developments uh, in offshore wind are uh, towards obviously floating uh, in very deep waters. Uh, what, what are the sort of depths that your techniques will, will handle with, without any issues? So um, if we go to, um, sorry, let me quickly jump to that slide. So this particular um, uh, scenario where I've considered the different water depths. So all of these are, um, 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 so Sheikh et al, uh, this, uh, this is uh, more than 500 meters. Uh, the Faro is almost a kilometer. Offshore Brazil, this study is uh, more than a kilometer, 1.7 kilometers. So all of these are like uh, really, uh, uh, the, 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 the shallowest one I have considered, the current uh, profile I've considered here is, I think, uh, 560 or something. So it is I think, uh, wow. fairly okay. in, the, in, in deep water. Right, right. So no, 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 no issues then when we look at the uh, floating structure for wind, because obviously we will not go in those sort of uh, depths. No, yeah, that's yeah. that's very nice. <clears throat> uh, in terms of computational effort, uh, Aaron, uh, mm -hmm. could you give us an idea more or less of uh, what sort of uh, resources you need uh, uh, yeah. to, 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 to compute so, your, your algorithm? Yeah, so so right now, uh, the wave current cases. I take one of the currents and I take one of the wave cases. On an average, these, uh, these are two two dimensional simulations. So these are 2D simulations. That's something that really factors in uh, uh, strongly. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at uh, maybe eight or nine hours of simulations on 64 processes that we have a supercomputer here uh, clustered on the, uh, at the university. So on that cluster, it takes about eight or nine hours. Um, I have run some. Currents. Uh, and that takes around uh, uh, about a day. Uh, 3D simulations, but again, uh, uh, when, when we have waves, currents and winds, I think we might be looking at uh, two days or three, two or three days of simulations, especially in 3D. Wow, wow, very, very exciting. No, that's nice, that's nice. My, my, final, my final question is, uh, are you working with a particular industry partner, uh, Arun, in your project? Uh, yes, uh, um, uh, so uh, I'm also uh, I'm I'm working with ETP, uh, and um, uh, and I'm also working with the, the industry partner is uh, uh, the, the uh, they are they're uh, based in China and uh, they they also partially fund my uh, my project. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry I'm I'm just blanking on their name exactly. No, don't worry. But yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no, an industry nice. partner and they're in China. Yeah. That's nice. That's nice. 
Uh, I was I was looking for your name in the internet, you know, to look at your publication, mm -hmm. and I see you have already a couple of them, right? Oh, I I'm not. Uh, I think that may be a mistake because I'm in the process of. So this one, this study right now, is something that I'm working on on, on writing. Uh, I'm right, uh, in the process of writing it up, and uh, this would be uh, my first publication. Oh, okay. okay. So <laughs> yeah. maybe one of your. Uh, it was, yeah, or... yeah. Yeah, but, but it was very interesting and... because it was Arun Kumar and it was working on modeling of wave and currents, you know? Interesting, interesting. Oh, anyway, okay. so <laughs> uh, I think that I, I see no questions in the discussion forum now. I think that uh, mm -hmm. uh, we will carry on with the next presentation. But first, Arun, thank you so much for for, for very nice presentation. And uh, please stay with us, okay? Don't, uh, yeah. don't go. We, we need you yeah. to be here, you know, to, to, to engage in the discussions. Right. Brenda, I think that we can go uh, to our next uh, uh, presentation with uh, Graham and Emily. Okay, right. thank you very much. Thank yes, I think that we, I see you now, Graham and Emily, very nice, very nice. Uh, uh, my colleagues from, from Strathclyde University. Good, good. Uh, Graham, I, I, will, I, I will let you to do a very brief introduction of yourself and Emily, you know, and then uh, you will have around uh, 20, 22 minutes, Graham, in total, you know, for your presentation. Uh, so give us uh, as, as uh, uh, much detail as possible, you know, uh, for the benefit of uh, myself and the audience. Yeah. Nice. Okay. okay, it will do. Thank you very much, Alan Poe. Um, so I'm Graham Hawker. I'm a recently appointed lecturer in energy systems at, at Strathclyde. And um, Emily is a new PhD student. So this is a new project that's being part funded by ETP in collaboration with the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And given that Emily literally started on this about three weeks ago, I thought it'd be quite unfair to ask her to present findings because it might be a very short presentation at this point. So instead, what I thought would be most useful is to give some background to this project. So essentially, I'll talk a little bit about the, the direction of Scottish energy security, why this is a kind of current and growing issue, and then why in particular offshore wind-derived hydrogen could be um, a future solution to this. And then I'll hand over to Emily who will uh, then talk a little bit about what she's uh, planning to do over the next three years to answer all the complicated and difficult questions I'm about to raise. Um, I'll, I'll mention as well that um, we've also got the University of Edinburgh involved in this, so Katrina Edelman um, is giving us some advice on hydrogen storage issues. Uh, so I'll be interested to hear from the next presenter as well um, around the outputs from their, their project. So as a little bit of background, um, we know there's big ambitions in offshore wind. So at a, a national level um, across Britain, we have the policy um, announcement of 40 gigawatts by 2030. And the Scottish government has um, last year stated that they're looking for around 11 gigawatts of offshore wind energy in Scottish waters, um, which is a big expansion. So it's a doubling essentially of what we already have. Um, but recently as well, we also have um, a policy announcement that follows the um, cooperation agreement between the SNP and the Greens, which is looking at a much more aggressive expansion of onshore wind as well. So looking for an additional eight to 12 gigawatts of onshore wind capacity. So also doubling onshore wind over the same period. And there are plenty of things flying around around how we reinforce the networks across Scotland to actually make sure this energy can get somewhere and be easily used. But even the kind of most ambitious network options that are being looked at out to 2030 are going to be some way behind the rate at which onshore and offshore wind will be developing. So we can expect there to be insufficient network capacity to host all this wind energy. The already large curtailment volumes that I'll talk about in a second are going to likely significantly increase. And while historically we've seen curtailment for the um, purposes of network management, so the network hasn't uh, been of sufficient capacity to deliver offshore wind or onshore wind around the country, in the future we're also going to see system-wide imbalances. So this is where the amount of renewable energy in the country as a whole, even if the network was in place to move it around, is going to be greater than the total demand at certain points in time. So this will lead to entirely new states of the system, and I'll say a little bit about this as well. But broadly, we are expecting that this large growth in offshore wind capacity is going to be entering an already highly congested market. We know that developers, SSE, Scottish Power, and uh, other small developers are looking at alternative uses of energy. 
if they can find things to do with this curtailed energy that isn't just trying to put it into the network, they're very interested in doing so. But at the same time, we also have to look at what else is happening on the system. So there's a policy announcement that unabated gas generation has to be gone from the system by 2035. So the um, large power station at Peterhead that runs on gas at the moment, uh, which is key to Scottish energy security um, and balancing in the face of all this wind power, has to move away from unabated burning of natural gas. So it has to end up with either CCS or burning hydrogen as an alternative fuel. Um, not mentioned on this slide as well, there's the nuclear station. So Hunterston is closing down this year and Torness um, has a current expectancy um, to be closing at the end of this decade. So we you know, we have to shift away from the current sources of um, thermal power production that we have in Scotland. But we do need to have some kind of flexible generation in Scotland in order to maintain system security to make sure that power stays on even if there's a fault on the transmission network connecting Scotland and England. So this is a broad kind of view of that transmission network. These are the key um, boundaries that we have on the system that cause constraints of moving energy around. Um, so an offshore wind farm that's connected into uh, the network from the Murray Firth, for example, is going to have a lot of issues um, getting energy south beyond these different transmission boundaries. But we may see additional capacity put in. So there's also the potential for the uh, North Connect interconnector to connect Scotland to Norway um, from a northern transmission zone. Also potential configurations of the Eastern Link HVDC and offshore cable that will directly bypass some of these uh, transmission bottlenecks. But still broadly, we can expect to see a large amount of curtailed energy as this wind capacity is installed in different bits of the network. And I guess as well as um, traditional offshore wind off the east coast of Scotland, we can expect to see the beginnings of floating wind off the west coast that is also going to be trying to connect into very congested areas of the network. And National Grid's own analysis backs this up, so they're showing um, how constraint costs, they don't put numbers directly on this, they're just highlighting in colours, but showing that these boundaries are going to lead to uh, greater costs than we see today on, on constraints, particularly the B6 boundary between Scotland and England uh, is going to lead to essentially large scale curtailment of energy in Scotland, even under quite aggressive network expansion scenarios. So when we say we're going to see more curtailment, well, what kind of numbers are we talking about? And this is a view of what curtailment in Scotland has looked like. So we added up all the curtailment of Scottish wind farms onshore and offshore to date. And you can see at the top that we're talking, you know, hundreds of gigawatt hours a month of energy is basically uh, unused from wind power in Scotland already. Um, there was a big, um, th there was a big uh, surge in curtailed energy in 2020 due to reduced reduced demand during the pandemic. So that's led to a bit of a blip in the data, but we can still see that the average is um, still extremely significant. And the money associated with this, of course, is also very high as well. So last month, um, for example, uh, November, there was a large amount of curtailment going on in, because of all these high winds and storm conditions that were happening. And something like uh, 32 million pounds um, was spent by the uh, system operator curtailing wind farms in Scotland. So these are already big numbers and these numbers are only likely to get bigger. Now, I said there a little bit about um, the increased curtailment that we saw in 2020. And this actually gives us a really useful case study for looking at what things are going to be like in the future. That reduced demand we saw in 2020 from people working from home during lockdown, greatly decreased business demand and so forth, gives us a kind of insight into actually what things will look like um, in 10 years time when the balance between renewable output and demand shifts, um, shifts quite significantly. So this top left plot here shows week by week in um, the early part of 2020, as we moved into lockdown, what the demand for energy on the uh, transmission system was. So the blue line is the weeks prior to lockdown, and then the kind of light blue moving into reds, the successive weeks of lockdown as more and more people were move, working from home, uh, reducing their demand, and also at the same time, the temperature increasing. So people's heating systems starting to turn off and greatly reducing uh, demand compared to its normal levels. And at the same time, we have a, quite a large 
amount of embedded wind. So there's about six gigawatts of embedded wind across the country. This is stuff in the distribution networks that can't necessarily be controlled by the system operator. We have around 13 gigawatts of solar panels on people's roofs across the country. Um, and at the time, this was hitting a peak of around 10 gigawatts at the time of year. And so if we kind of adjust for all of this, we can see that the raw demand for energy um, at a distribution level was getting quite low. So down to this kind of 20 gigawatt level in the off, uh, in the off peak. But notably, the midday um, minimum was significantly lower than normal. So we actually got down to a middle of the day minimum distribution level demand across the whole of GB of around 26 gigawatts. So if you start to add this up, you quickly see that um, with 13 gigawatts of solar capacity, 6 gigawatts of embedded wind, this stuff not really dispatchable, nothing the system operator can do about it. That takes you to 19 gigawatts of just embedded renewable stuff, leaving you a gap of around 7 gigawatts compared to demand. And we have roughly 8 gigawatts of nuclear power on the system, which again is not meant to be dispatchable. So we were getting to a system state um, last year around April, May, where we were getting very, very close to the operating limits of the system just in normal during the day operations, where we couldn't actually leave enough operating room on the system um, for gas plant to operate flexibly and back up uh, and keep a secure system running. And that's even after all the um, transmission connected controllable wind was already all turned off at huge cost. So this was a highly unideal um, state for the system to be in. But as I say, it's quite representative of where we can expect to be by the end of this decade. The solution at the time was rather blunt. So National Grid basically went to one of these nuclear power plants said we have to find a big reduction in generation from somewhere and basically pay size well be a uh, sizable sum of money to um, turn down its output, which is not something we ever want to do. You, you don't build a nuclear power station not to make use of it. Um, and you certainly don't want to be paying each power station to not be generating. And this contract was in place till roughly September last year. So this was a very blunt um, approach to this, just basically something that had to be done to make sure that the system would stay operable throughout this low demand. And we would much prefer if rather than wasting all this renewable energy um, that's being curtailed, and rather than turn down nuclear power stations, if there was um, better sources of flexibility in the system to maintain system security. If we look out to the future, then this picture becomes even more extreme. Um, so this is again, um, Britain, British scale rather than Scotland, but it's the same um, idea for both locations, where if you look at this balance of um, energy demand versus renewables on the system, we are going to end up with cases where we have substantial um, peak demand, as well as um, periods where the total residual demand on the system is going to be strongly negative. So down here, you've got heavy curtailment of wind, negative electricity prices, um, and at the other end, still having to meet a significant peak of energy when people are demanding electricity and uh, wind power isn't available. So any form of flexibility in storage can help us overcome this. If we, if we can store energy uh, down at this end when energy is basically free or even negative cost and shift it to supply at the peak, then this is um, a really desirable thing to do. And hydrogen, of course, is one of the factors we can use to do that. We can convert this spare energy into hydrogen and use it to power, for example, CCGTs at Peterhead um, during those peak periods. The usual argument against doing this is that if you use electricity to make hydrogen and then burn hydrogen to make electricity, it's incredibly inefficient. You're losing at least 70% of the energy um, through that round trip process. But the counter argument to that is, well, if you're doing it with electricity that's free and using it to produce electricity at a time when you might be seeing electricity prices 100 times the normal wholesale cost of energy, then a round trip efficiency of 30% is really unimportant compared to that massive imbalance in, in electricity price. So this is essentially the focus of what we want to look at. Um, if we use this massive surplus of offshore renewables to produce hydrogen, to potentially then use that in the energy system either to offset um, 
heat demand by direct use or by powering uh, CCTT plants to back up the system. It, is this a better way of operating the system than what we have today? And does it maintain the level of security that we're used to in Scotland due to having things like feed ahead and nuclear plants available that we can't rely on in the future? And I've always liked this diagram, not mine. Um, my ex-colleague Simon Gill produced this a few years back that also gives a bit of a um, helpful bit of context to this. So this is where energy is stored in the UK. So this is about five years ago, so it changed a fair bit since then. But if you just look at where we have energy stored in different forms, these fossil-based stocks are enormous stores of energy that we rely on for our system security. We rely on the fact um, petrol stations have huge stores of petrol, uh, re refineries and so forth. We rely on the fact that we have large natural gas storage. Um, and previously we have relied on big coal stocks, so not to the same extent anymore. If we look at the electricity system, we're talking about tiny bits of storage in comparison to that. So if we're decarbonizing, we're losing this huge chunk of natural gas storage that our electricity system relies on and basically replacing it with these tiny chunks. So if we are to do this, there is a big question about where we get this similar level of flexibility, ability to ride through um, adverse events from. So as, as my kind of final slide of this, um, these are all the kind of high level concepts. This is why we want to do, to do this, why we want to look at these futures. But we want to put numbers on this. We want to try and quantify the actual benefits that come out of this. So we want to look at aspects of the power system, such as specific reliability and resilience. So having this throughput of offshore renewable energy into hydrogen, how does it actually help us in terms of um, metrics on system reliability and resilience? What advantages would it give Scotland to have, for example, um, a big North Sea bulk storage of hydrogen that's there available um, to power up, for example, Peterhead during periods when, when we need it? So I'll, I'll stop talking now. I've probably given more than enough background and I'll pass over to Emily who, who can say a little bit about what she's going to spend the, the, the next three years working on. Thank you. So as Graham said, I only started doing this project last month. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the research questions and then the kind of plan that we've got for the next three years. So one of the main things that Graham has like been talking about there is the importance of looking at future energy demands and flexibility so our like first question is like under the future electricity system with a component of hydrogen derived electricity generation what kind of proportion of offshore wind output should be directed to electrolysis to ensure we have system security um, and then next i'll be looking at what kind of trade-offs we can expect in system security um, if we couple the gas and electricity networks, which leads nicely into the next question of what kind of contribution can hydrogen storage make in maintaining system security and reducing costs? Uh, lastly, I'll be looking closer at the more economic side of things um, and looking into whether producing hydrogen from offshore wind will be lower in cost than, say, carbon capture from methane uh, combustion. So those are the questions that I'm going to be looking at. And this slide has the like work plan for my next three years. Um, so my first year, m mostly just literature review um, on security metrics, hydrogen system constraints, storage locations. Um, we're hoping that we can get access to the Scottish Times out, um, outputs so that I can do some time series data uh, uh, sorry, I can do some um, looking at data sets and looking at coupled energy system scenarios, um, which will lead nicely on to my second year where I'm going to be developing um, a gas and electricity system model. Uh, final year, looking more into the economic side of things. Um, so assessment of wind and electrolyzer configurations and looking more into the Scottish Times models again. So uh, <laughs> to finish off, uh, 
if you'd like to get in touch, if you have anything further to discuss or you're doing like complimentary work to what I might be doing, please go ahead and email me. I'm always eager to learn new things and I'm sure Graham would be happy to answer any emails as well. Thank you very much. I'll stop there and hand back over to Olympo. <laughs> okay, many thanks, many thanks Graham, Emily for a very, very informative uh, a presentation about the, uh, your PhD project, uh, Emily. And, uh, and yeah, certainly, I mean, obviously this, this topic is uh, high in the agenda, you know, and it's uh, a very hot topic. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you uh, heard so many, 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 many discussions in the COP26, you know, about, mm -hmm. about this aspect. Uh, I, I don't see questions in the discussion forum right now. Uh, oh, there is one uh, by, by Stephanie, Stephanie Mann. And the question is, do you see the efficiency of the electricity, hydrogen electricity cycle improving as more is added to the system? What sort of efficiencies can we expect? Can you, can you see the discussion forum, Graham? Yeah, yeah I can oh, see sorry. So I don't need to, to, to read the questions. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so certainly, um, I believe the kind of existing reviews of electrolysis technology show us that we do expect um, simultaneously with cost reduction in electrolysis, um, improvements in efficiency. Um, but frankly, we're still talking relatively small numbers. You know, the, the round trip efficiency might get up to something like 40 percent, whereas I believe currently it's looked at being high 20s to possibly 30. But you know, it's still never going to get to the point where the round trip conversion is going to be um, a, a non-wasteful use of electricity, as it were. So th this is very much the you know, the argument I'm making stays core cool here. If we can use electricity directly, we should do so. It, you know, if we're looking at a heat system, um, for example, if we can put electricity into heat pumps, that is always going to be energetically better been converting it to hydrogen and burning that because that's like a 70 percent efficiency but we know that trying to do that with every unit of electricity in the system ends up being incredibly costly for its own reasons because of all the massive overbuilding of network that is required so there is a balance somewhere to be struck between direct use of electricity and conversion via hydrogen that also gives us all these other additional benefits that have an economic value as well in terms of security. So that's something that we're essentially trying trying to quantify. Yeah, we have another one by by Paul Kerr there, uh, Graham. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I can versus CCS. So I think yes, we we've, we've put this this in. It'd be interesting if we can come up with some economic outputs. Hydrogen and CCS are essentially the two competing technologies. Do you convert a big power station to CCS? or do you convert it to hydrogen? Both get you um, towards net zero. There is an argument that the hydrogen is better because it's actual net zero, where CCS will only be 90 odd percent efficient in its best case. Um, so we would be, so one of the things we do want to kind of dig out of this is, um, can we come some kind of evaluation between hydrogen and CCS? And I certainly, yeah, we don't have the answer to that yet, but it's something we, we hope to try and draw out of this. Nice. Another uh, one by Christopher there. Very, very exciting topic. So, so Paul's mentioning hydrogen combustion and fuel cells uh, uh, as well. Um, so essentially, we are we are looking at the large scale. So we're focusing on hydrogen combustion. We're looking at transmission level electricity system. We're looking at, um, like I say, the uh, generation of hydrogen for it to be burnt to um, in large scale power stations to balance the system um, rather than alternative use of hydrogen, such as in small scale fuel cells and uh, vehicles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And Christopher, yeah. So if hydrogen is used as part of the solution to the waste of energy abatement, has it a more flexible spark network? So th th these are all flexibility solutions. Um, we are not certainly not pretending that hydrogen is the only flexibility solution. Um, demand side management, interconnectors, um, other forms of non-carbon intensive electricity generation can all add to this mix. So we're definitely not trying to say that there is only one solution to this. I think the argument I'm trying to make, if anything, is we need every possible flexibility option uh, in the system. And I would say, particularly with our Nordic neighbors, there's a current argument going on, I think, as to whether the Norwegians are particularly happy with the idea of us 
using their um, using their pump storage and market to to reduce our own flexibility issues uh, because Norwegian customers will be paying more for their energy as a result of North Connect. So I think there's a, a bit of a political issue there. Yeah. Yeah, one more, one more question there uh, by uh, Suan Kai. Uh, mm -hmm. Suan Kai, Kai, forgive me. Yeah, can you see it? Yeah. Um, so the efficiency of the electricity hydrogen, so that's that's more efficient. So we're talking something like 70% because you're only dealing with the electrolysis part. You're not you're not then burning um, the uh, hydrogen for power generation. So that is potentially a much better use of hydrogen but it doesn't necessarily contribute to the whole um, system security angle. So it's a little bit out of scope for what, for what we're looking at. Um, comparative options in heating are their own, it, its own area of argument, I would say, um, because yes, that's a better use energetically than what we're talking about having a round trip use of hydrogen. But on the other hand, you're competing against heat pumps, which energetically are going to be anything you can do um, with the fuel-based solution. Yeah, very good, very good. And we have one more minute, perhaps, for one more question for Graham and Emily. I, I realize I've taken up all, all, all the answers that giving Emily a chance to, to speak. No, that's nice, that's nice. Uh, this is a very, very exciting uh, topic, of course. Uh, Graham, Emily, so you will be uh, looking at what what is being called green hydrogen production, not the blue hydrogen. That, that's right. That's right. So specifically because we're putting it in the context of offshore wind imbalances. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. So no, congratulations to both Graham for, to you for your uh, uh, recent appointment as lecturer and to Emily for uh, picking up this uh, very exciting project. So I wish you uh, uh, the best and uh, and yes, I think that we are ready then to move to our next presentation. Uh, Brenda, uh, 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 I think our next presenter is uh, Lubica. Lubica, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, can you hear me? And can you Excellent. Hear me? Yes, yes, there you go. Very nice. Uh, uh, Lubica Slabon, yeah, from uh, uh, University of Edinburgh. So you will continue on the topic of hydrogen. Now, uh, uh, how to store hydrogen uh, efficiently. So please, uh, Lubica, again, you have like around 20 minutes, you know, for your presentation in total, uh, with, uh, with some time at the end for questions as well. Yeah. Okay, so can you see my first slides at all? Yeah, yeah, we can see them, yeah. Okay, perfect. So hello to everyone. And I will talk you through a brief assessment of oil and gas fields and their suitability for underground hydrogen storage as a part of site selection criteria process. Hydrogen has been found as an efficient energy carrier and a good alternative to presently used fossil fuels due to its dual usage of delivering energy or storing energy, as Graham has just mentioned a couple of minutes ago before me really. Um, and its versatility has been widely recognized by many governments, including the UK. However, it does not make it an exclusive solution to decarbonization. So we cannot really take hydrogen um, as a silver bullet to solve all the, all the problems. Um, the areas where um, hydrogen can certainly help are um, interseasonal storage balance, uh, bulk transport, so discussed and challenging domestic heating and it also has an uh, opportunity to become in to become a valuable export commodity hydrogen economy will require a substantial amount of hydrogen the need of that big volume um, is not only triggered by the system needs but also by the molecule characteristic itself being of very small density uh, light molecule on one side by, but high energy density by mass on other. Hydrogen is almost three times energetically denser than gas and almost six times energetically denser than black coal. So where to go and where, where, where what are the storage options really? So the slide shows discharge time against power and the surface tanks can hold around kilowatt hours within the time of minutes and hours. 
This time would refer an average UK gas usage for a single household per year. And we are going to need a lot of more storage that can be held in such tanks to reach net zero. Any power requirement or discharging time above that will rely on some form of geological storage. Uh, with the salt caverns, we can scale up to gigawatt hours and with storage in porous rocks, we can scale up to terawatt hours. Having that said, in context of giga and terawatt hours, the salt caverns are good and having great ceiling properties being almost impermeable however, geographically constrained to occurrence of salt lithology. In terms of porous rocks, considered are saline aquifers and depleted oil and gas fields. Recently carried estimations of possible capacities revealed that storage capacities of both saline aquifers and gas fields within the North Sea hugely exceeds the energy storage demand and need. Prior to any storage and injection, the site must be carefully selected and selection criteria well understood. Those are often linked to effective storage with regard to any hydrogen losses. The concept diagram you can, you can see right now introduces the main processes that can result in hydrogen losses from reservoirs. Um, reading the slide from the left to the right, highlighted in green are microbial processes. Here, the hydrogen is bacterially catalyzed and new gases like methane, acetic acid, or hydrogen sulfate are produced. So basically, hydrogen is being consumed by um, oxidizing bacteria. Geochemical processes that can rework or trap available hydrogen are in yellow. Um, this is mainly about fluid-fluid interaction, gas mixing, and fluid-drop interaction. When inject injecting hydrogen into any geological formation, a presence of a resident fluid needs to be borne in mind. That brings us to multi-phase flow that significantly influences the gas flow through the rocks. And, and those processes I ha ha are highlighted in, in, in blue. The last part, the pink part of the diagram, presents group of processes referring to physical leakage through the existing or induced faults or fractures. The structural integrity of the reservoir and seal is absolutely key, and the phenomena like built up buoyancy pressure and capillary leakage can um, seriously affect or rule of uh, sealing capacity. There is a whole bunch or list of influential parameters linked to just introduced processes. Um, but there are few parameters that can be found in each group. Those mutual parameters are um, pressure, temperature, and salinity. The parameters have impact on the likelihood of processes development and the degree of their progressions. Before going through the individual parameters, let me briefly present the parameters origin. The values were gathered from 207 oil and gas fields and subfields within the UK waters. The studied area was split into six regions, which locations are shown on the map. And the region namely are um, Southern North Sea, Central North Sea, from the Central North Sea, Deep Sea, uh, Deep Central North Sea has been excluded, uh, which we are basically talking about high pressure, high temperature wells. Um, then it's Northern North Sea, Atlantic Margin, and Irish Sea. Well, so let's have a look at parameters. The first parameter to start with is pressure. The higher the pressure we can reach in the reservoir, the more energy we can store and the density of the stored hydrogen is higher. Um, secondly, the pressure of tight rocks, rocks seals, rules the entry pressure threshold for hydrogen to break through the, the seal and influences the reservoir integrity. Um, the pressure regime needs to be understood as well for any reservoir engineering operations like injection or recovery. Um, if we look for the reservoir or for the fields um, with higher pressure, then we would go to Northern North Sea, if excluding high pressure, high temperature wells. 
Um, so that would be a northern North Sea where we would be finding reservoir with, with higher pressure. Um, the graph on your right shows the relationship between um, pressure and hydrogen density. Um, and you can see that the relationship is very strong um, and it's almost linear. So basically, if we look where we could store denser hydrogen, it would be the same region as we saw on the previous slide. So again, it would be Northern North Sea. Talking about the pressure and geological storage, the depth plays an important role. And this is to illustrate how hydrogen density changes with depth. If we consider hydrogen density at atmospheric pressure and ambient temperature, then within one kilometer depth, it increases 100 times. And that is notable when consider a large volume of hydrogen. Um, and for example, if we took an average size of gas field at a depth of 1000 meters, accounting for 50% of cushion gas, we should be able to store around 23 terawatt hours, which is almost a third of UK heating requirement. So going underground really means upscaling the hydrogen storage. Second parameter to look at is temperature. Temperature is absolutely key for microbial and geochemical processes and governs biogenesis. Um, if you look at the map, so then we would see or we can see that the hottest area of the North Sea um, is central North Sea and deep central North Sea. That's where the, the fields with the higher temperature values can be found. Um, this is just to show the difference of influentiality of pressure and temperature on hydrogen density. The trend of uh, temperature to be influential to hydrogen density can be seen, but it's less pronounced compared to pressure. So really um, density um, follows the, the pressure. Similarly to temperature, salinity also impacts uh, the microbial processes and geochemical reactions. Apart from that, salinity indirectly governs sealing efficacy of the reservoir. The higher the salinity, the smaller the density difference between the stored gas and brine and the lower the buoyancy pressure. The fields with the most saline brine are located within Southern North Sea and Irish Sea. Our three key parameters were then used to set the threshold criteria in order to assess the data set for hydrogen storage with aim to maximize effectiveness and minimize losses. The pressure was set to be 15 megapascal to ensure storage efficiency and to be in agreement with the maximum of the national grid. I mean, the maximum the national grid can transfer um, in terms of pressure. The temperature was set up to be 122 degrees to restrict microbial um, activity of three, the most common hydrogen reducing bacteria and the last parameter was salinity, and that was set up also to tackle oxidizing bacteria, to minimize hydrogen solubility, and eliminate the buoyancy pressure by having denser brine. The data set was then assessed by a few criteria combinations based on the individual or combined effect, uh, effect of parameters. Uh, the pressure criteria is held for all the scenario the same, and coupled with salinity or temperature. If the temperature is high enough or the salinity is high enough, it's satisfactory to have only one of these at place in order to hinder mic microbial losses. That said, the latest research showed that combination of temperature greater than 55 degrees Celsius and at the same time having salinity of 115 gram per kilograms reduces risk of adverse microbial effect as well. So let's let's have a look at the map where those fields are located that pass the criteria. So if if we look at the temperature first, so all the fields with higher temperature are located at uh, Central North Sea and Northern North Sea. Um, the fields having very high salinity are Southern North Sea and deep 
Central North Sea. And uh, if we go with the third and the newest criterion, having moderate temperature and moderate salinity um, magnitude, um, so that bring us um, to Central North Sea, Southern North Sea, uh, just a couple maybe we would find Northern North Sea. So, so the spread spread is, is ma ma definitely wider. So what we what we can conclude based based on this? I say that the deeper we go, the higher the hydrogen density, the higher the mass per volume, and the less buoyant hydrogen means higher the retention column beneath the cap rock. Um, if we are after deep reservoir with higher pressure and higher temperature, then, then we would be at central North Sea or northern North Sea, which is great because the microbial losses are, are the box is ticked. Um, but on the other side, we are being in the region of central North Sea and northern North Sea. We are in oil Provence and the knowledge, our knowledge on gas and oil interaction is fairly limited. So from this point of view, maybe that's not, not the ideal um, where to go to store. Other aspect is that temperature is fine to tackle um, microbial losses. On another hand, on another side, um, for example, quartz precipitation or cementation um, occurs at the window between 70 and 130 degrees Celsius. So basically that's the, exactly the window where we want to be to eliminate microbial losses, but we are having cementation. These alter poroperm characteristics, porosity and permeability, and overly impacts the flow. Looking at the high salinity, then again, it does mitigate, mitigate the microbial activity, albeit not that successful as temperature maybe, enhances storage security, but can also support some of the geochemical reaction, bearing higher amount of minerals, being more saline. So looking at the map and the region with the high salinity fields are, that's in this case, we are in Southern North Sea, which is gas Provence, and that suits the current knowledge on gas-gas interaction. And that's also provides certain benefits to underground storage um, in terms of existing infrastructure and remaining gas with the potential to be a cushion gas, for example, to, to maintain the pressure. But there is still another aspect to look at. And one of, one of the most important, I would say, is um, energy resources and where the energy resources are. The highlighted in yellow on the map, the existing, there are the existing wind farms. These are mostly located within the Southern North Sea, which is fine for the reason have just been explained but the prospective ones highlighted in pink, they are all at the north, which is not that ideal being in predominantly all Provence. So an alternative, we, we might, might be looking for alternative, we would like to stay in that region and store over there. So yeah, it, one, one can have a feeling that this is a kind of vicious circle, which might be true to a certain extent. Nevertheless, bearing in mind the variety, I mean, geological variety of the North Sea and present knowledge that progresses further and further each day, I do believe that to find a right storage site for hydrogen will not be that difficult once the selection criteria um, are well understood and having all the, all the infrastructure in, in the place. And that's basically how I tried to very briefly introduce the process of, uh, of site selection criteria, applying some, some basis criteria um, and uh, ready for a question. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, for an excellent presentation, Lupica. That's, that's very uh, Let me see if I have, see, if, I, if I see some questions in the forum. Uh, I, I don't see questions at the moment. Can you see any questions, Lubica, in the discussion forum? No, no right? I don't think so, no. No, that, that's okay, that's okay. So I have one, one minor uh, question, and this one is perhaps due to my ignorance. Eh? So maybe if it's the wrong question, just forgive me.
could you give us a sort of an idea of of, of costs of uh, storing, for example, a, a carbon, you know, or storing a, a, any other type of a, a hydrogen, you, you, you are do, doing that, storing a other type of gas, you know, a, what, what sort of costs we, we, we are talking about? If you can give us a, a, a comparison, you know, maybe not with exact numbers, but to say, well, just to give an idea on input, this is if you want to store hydrogen, you may have this cost associated compared to uh, uh, storing uh, ammonia or anything else, you know? Thank you, Olimpo. I, I know exactly what you mean. And it's quite um, often question that people are asking, tell me what's the cost and how the effectivity is or what's the, what's the price, what's the cost for, uh, let's say, um, one megawatt hours of, of stored uh, hydrogen. And Unfortunately, I don't have really answer for this one because what we are missing in the industry is uh, we, we don't have a project of that and nobody has ever stored the hydrogen for these purposes that has been just discussed. I can tell you that, yeah, of course, if you compare it to the gas, so that's um, plenty of experience and years of infrastructure and it's simply the place. Um, so, so it's known and it's there and it's cheaper. Um, I'm not sure how it would be now comparing um, CO2 if you want to store CO2 and, and hydrogen, but that's exactly, that, that's two different story. And yeah. I don't think that we can compare it because one is going to be stored to be there for forever and another is going to be stored just to be withdrawn again, maybe within right. like a few weeks or months. Um, what we can see is that there are a couple or few, but just just the one in in UK, which would be Orkney, like a small scale project, and they are using their hydrogen. But they are how they are storing it there. It's in um, in is in cylinders. They they've got a small tank, but mostly in cylinders, are uh, using it as a fuel cell. And then what they are doing right now, they are building um, a, a big battery. So like a shed of the battery next to the yeah. electrolyzer. But again, it's not underground storage. So um can't really give you any number. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's perfectly understandable, Lubica. No, that's good. But to hear your comments is always is always very beneficial, you know, for, for, for the people in the in the in the session. No, that's good. Um I, I think that uh, Stephanie uh, 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 is not presenting today. So I think that uh, Lubica, this is going to be your this is going to be the last presentation, Lubica, but don't go yet. No, don't go. Uh, I have one final question, Lubica, uh, and it's in terms of safety, you know, as well. I mean, when you when you do this type of a, 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 a storage systems uh, underground, you know, uh, are there any particular things that uh, we need to look at in terms of safety? The most the, the biggest danger about about hydrogen is when uh, it leaks and when it's confined, when it's in, in, in confined space yeah. and then can ignite. But apart from that, uh, it can leak, but it can disappear so quickly because it's so light and it's so diffusive. So let's say if we are talking about um, storing in underground and let's say offshore, that's far away from public, if you mean this, um, danger, and I would say it's 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 pretty it's pretty safe. Safe. Um, yeah. The the safe it means it's not like the safe that would be there and cannot leak. It, mm -hmm. it probably can, and there there could be the whole board. It could be cracks. It could be fracture in, in, induced, for example, by cyclicity and pressure changes all the time. You know, after months or weeks when injecting this drawer. But I mean, in terms of it's difference if it leaks of some portion of hydrogen into the water and it just disappears quickly. Let's say if it leaked um, maybe on offshore in public where the measurements are not uh, at, at the place and it, it can be in confined area and can just, just combust. Okay. Um, so yeah, with, with the safety is and another um, mistake what we, what we do and I think it is that in terms of safety, we are trying to fit the current measurements we had designed many decades for gas, and we are trying to to just fit it to the hydrogen. But it's just a different medium and mm -hmm. needs a different approach. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more dangerous. Okay. Okay. Nice. Than the hydro hydrocarbon we are using at the present. 
Okay, thanks very much, Lubica. I see you have a couple of questions there uh, uh, in the discussion forum. One from Stephanie, another one from Katriona. If you want to look at those, uh, please, Lubica. What are the long-term storage losses for hydrogen in deep sea or salt caverns? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't think, um, in terms of salt caverns, um, the losses are minimum because as, far, as I know, the salt caverns are almost impermeable, so they are very good sealer. If there are some losses, so then the losses could be um, could be through the borehole or um, through the um, operation. Um, I mean, when you're injecting or withdrawal, but uh, but as as as, as storing them in the salt caverns itself as as a, as a medium as a box, we won't uh, that should be quite safe. Mm -hmm. And then there is another one. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Katrina. <laughs> Can you comment on the issues that might impact the recovery of hydrogen from porous stores? Yes, the if we are going into the porous porous rocks, so there are a few issues. So the, the first one is how we set um, our reservoir engineering. So how we set the pressure and um, and how we recover um, hydrogen from those and how how sealed the, the boreholes are so that we, that could be one problem of, of hydrogen leakage another one is uh, potential gas mis mixing with cushion gas in the reservoir so once we inject um, pure hydrogen into the reservoir but we might not get as pure reservoir um, as pure hydrogen when we're getting it out of the reservoir so that could be another aspect maybe um, and then the leakage processes I've, I've mentioned in my slides as well um, that's yeah, what just popped instantly yep. in, my, in my mind. No, that's nice. That's nice, Lubica. I think we have other questions there from Go, uh, Gordon and Christopher, but these are uh, general, you know, one from Gordon is for uh, for Aaron, and then Christopher has a general in terms of transportation of hydrogen. Uh, so, uh, Lubica, I think that in terms of questions for you, uh, I think this is okay right now, you know. Uh, Lubica, are you uh, at the end of your PhD or this is part of our research project? If you could just give me a bit of details there. Yeah, that's that's my uh, PhD project. Oh, fantastic. And uh, are you towards, I mean, the middle, uh, towards the end or, or what stage? I've just I've just started my second year. And basically, um, the, the study I just presented was <laughs> oh. um, kind of, uh, it was kind of alternative to, to my core of the project because my core of my project is experimental work. Wow. And it's a measurement of uh, capillary pressure saturation uh, curves for hydrogen, but because all the labs weren't accessible last year, so instead of doing of course, experiments, to, I did desk, mm -hmm. desk study, yeah, and I, I produced this. Wow, <laughs> no, it's impressive, it's impressive, well done, well done, well done, very good work so far, so uh, keep, keep, keep up, you know, the, the, the good work. Okay, so uh, uh, then Brenda Gordon, I think, as you suggested, we have time for for bringing over uh, to to the to the stage all, all of our presenters uh, to have a, a final discussion. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Thanks very much, Brenda. I can see now uh, all of you here. Uh, fantastic. So uh, first, Arun, if you could uh, respond to that question by Gordon, you know, uh, in terms of about the the, the that the uh, particular value for water depth to be ideal. You see that question, Arun? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I um, that was a question from me too, Lubeka, because I, I posted it. Oh, forgive me. <laughs> okay, yeah. fine. Forgive me. For, sorry for that. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you ah, okay. Water depth, you mean for hydrogen storage? Yes, yes. I looked, um, no. I don't. I, I'm not sure what 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 do you mean. It doesn't really. You know, the hydrogen storage. What I, I was talking is underground. So basically, the water column is above the, the seas above. Oh, and, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 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 the water that you are talking about would make sense mm. for for the wind farms, which are at yes. vicinity producing yes. that, but not really for what I'm talking. Yeah, and, that, that's and that's I why I was about, I was a bit thrown away by the temperature chart because that was that seemed really high, but yeah, now I see. No, that was the temperature you were having in reservoirs. Yeah, in the yeah I see, I see, yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah, talking about water depths, it was all in North Sea, so we are basically mm -hmm. talking about roughly um, average is around 140 meters. Um, oh, okay. uh, North Sea is generally shallow. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's that would be the water types we are talking about. 
Okay. Yeah, no, this, is, this is nice. Okay, so, uh, well, I think that we have about uh, 10 to 12 minutes, you know, uh, before we end the session. Uh, so now that we have all you here, uh, th there are some things that maybe all of you can comment, you know, and it's in terms of uh, a couple of questions by, by Christopher, which are related uh, to the infrastructure that is needed, you know, to, 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 to obviously accelerate the use of, of hydrogen. Uh, that 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 uh, question is uh, 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 at the end. Uh, uh, and if perhaps uh, Graham, can you see that question? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, maybe, so, maybe so. Graham, if I if I if I ask you to to start you, with your with your thoughts on that, and then one question for me will be in terms of having your thoughts about what are the milestones that we need to 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 achieve, you know, uh, in order to obviously to 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 make a, a hydrogen a reality, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yes, Graham, please let us start with that uh, question by Christopher, please. Okay, so I'll, I'll go for Christopher's first question around um, hydrogen energy being used by communities. So um, the Scottish Government just last month put out their hydrogen action plan, which sets out the kind of route to market for hydrogen development over the next um, over the next decade. So I think there's a lot of um, organisations out there and off takers of hydrogen who are looking out to 2030 plus basically when legislation will force them to move away from existing um, high carbon fuel sources. But the difficulty is the next 10 year period where there isn't really a strong incentive for them to do that because hydrogen is expensive and will be expensive for some time. So the kind of um, key off takers that identify probably fall into three groups. There's aviation and shipping, basically because they don't really have any other choice. There's not many options for them to use to decarbonize. So they know that they're gonna to have to shift to hydrogen at some point and hence are getting ahead of the, uh, uh, ahead of the curve. Um, there's local councils responsible for transport. So um, I think there's discussions ongoing between Scottish Power who are building an exercise at Whiteley and Glasgow Council, for example, to use um, hydrogen buses. And then the third one is kind of a bit out there, but the companies out there who actually can use this as a marketing opportunity. So in particular, um, distillers are very interested in hydrogen. Um, Diageo and companies like that are very keen to get well ahead of, on the curve because they can start promoting zero carbon whiskey and things like this. Um, and this is identified by the Scottish government as well as a potential pretty uh, important initial source. Um, but if you look at the Scottish government publication, I think they identify about 20 different existing um, customers around the country. The, the key bit is getting through that phase of cost reduction to where hydrogen is actually a viable prospect for, for everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. And the other, just a very quickly on the other question on the uh, existing operating companies, well, they have to be involved because this is an existential crisis for them. If you're a natural gas company, you are extinct in the next decade. So if you're not engaging with hydrogen, that's the end of your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just maybe comment on the last um, yes, please, um, yeah, yeah. In, in infrastructure as well. So, um, yeah, the, there's been a declaration made by, um, I think it was government a few, few months ago, that uh, gas um, existing gas uh, infrastructure should be able and capable to or suitable to use for, for hydrogen. And uh, that was presented as, as, as having a one asset basically done and ready to promote the the large scale hydrogen economy using those assets. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how, how it really would work, whether it's, we can st straightly use them or not, because if you've got traces of the gas in, in those spice, so I, I suppose that it still can react maybe with, um, with carbon being there um, in this gas. Uh, but, uh, but, but certainly it was, it was um, I don't know, presented as, as one of possibility. And that's exactly the same for the offshore offshore pipelines. And um, as I said, that's very convenient for existing wind farms, which are in gas province in the Southern North Sea, maybe less convenient for the new sources, which are on, on the North. There are a few pipelines um, for gas because we still can use some of the fields they are having gas caps. So there are still few, but not that many. And then there, there, there was another research as well done by Danish company, which I can, I cannot, I can't recall, I cannot remember right now. I can, I can provide that. And they made the research last year, I think, and uh, they said, yeah, the existing pipes can be used, but even better maybe it would be to use um, um, some 
plastic, special plastic pipes or for, for hydrogen as well, in case that the present infrastructure would be too old, for example. Yes, very nice, very nice. Good, good. So uh, the, the other thing that I was uh, uh, wondering, uh, colleagues, is uh, if, if you could more or less comment on the milestones that you, well, uh, uh, you think will be necessary, you know, to achieve over uh, over time in order to, to make hydrogen a reality in, in our uh, energy, well, in energy, energy systems. Mm -hmm. Any, any thoughts on that in general uh, as to why, what is it that you you think is this is we need to sort this out first before we move on to the to this other aspect you know in order to to facilitate uh, or, or expedite uh, hydrogen yeah exploitation mm -hmm. uh, in my point of view it really is i don't know about your opinion graham but uh, there is a problem with uh, with infra infrastructure generally it doesn't matter whether it would have been pipelines to use for hydrogen, talking about hydrogen, or it would be electricity straight away, like cable and then to connection to the national grid. But uh, looking at the place where the, all the resources are um, and the capacity of the grid is just, it doesn't agree to each other, uh, really. So I, I can see quite, quite, quite a big gap in uh, um, not producing um, or having the end user of, uh, let's say, hydrogen or electricity, but but really how to transfer and distribute it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think there's also um, the, the issue that we have always had a very national, um, as in UK scale view of energy. We have a, a, a Great Britain scale electricity market. And one of the problems is that, you know, uh, these wind farms that are curtailed aren't actually allowed to sell their electricity locally, which would be one solution to that problem because they would be undermining the general electricity market. So we have renewable producers interested in hydrogen sort of as a um, bypass of the regulations that stops them from selling that electricity directly to, to local consumers, which is perhaps hydrogen as a solution to a policy problem rather than an actual technical problem. But I think this points towards the fact we need to get away from this gross natural national view of energy towards regional solutions identifying where we can kickstart these kind of clusters of hydrogen use, industrial clusters in particular, that are intense, very intensive users of natural gas at the moment, that get us started in bits and pieces of the country, um, which happens fine in other parts of the world. Scandinavia is very used to municipal view of energy. We're just very used to this national scale system. But if we can get that local view, then I think this kickstarts things a bit better. But then we start to have to think about um, the inequalities that introduces into the system. And I know this is very important to the Scottish Government because um, they're very aware that any trajectory we take has a huge impact on, for example, the entire economy of the northeast of Scotland. If you don't achieve a sensible transition away from fossil fuels, what happens to the population of Aberdeen? What's, you know, you, you cause an economic crisis in a large part of the country. So that angle has to be taken into account as well. We, we, we get into a kind of just transition and non-technical um areas as well yeah it's pretty much it's re pretty much to move from the system we inherited uh, which was built for the coal and uh, all the all the distribution network and electrical network was just designed where the the electricity was was generated and it doesn't suit the the new the new system at all and when you mentioned um those so-called smart local energy systems um which have been promoted by the government recently quite quite a lot. Yeah, it certainly um, bears some part of the cost to avoid to to invest in the grid. Let's say, like in North East or North Northwest generally, North. But I, I'm not sure whether that can be a solution, like you know, to to secure national national need as as a whole. Um, the the local energy smart local energy systems are, are, are definitely great and i'm not against because yeah the people can use their own and manage their own sources energy sources and um and actually develop plenty of um of, of smart models that can be made applied in in large scale mm -hmm. but yeah how to put them all together to make sure that mm -hmm. um that on a national level you you are covered sustainably yeah. 
I think there's been a lot of debate around should we do this technology or that technology, but it's almost 2022. We've got 2030 targets. We've got you know eight years left yeah. to make yeah. some fairly major steps. So it's not a case of this or that. It's a case of pretty much everything. Everything, right? That's that's very interesting. Yes. Now I have a couple of uh, points, you know, for for discussion here. Uh, one is in terms of, uh, of skills uh, that we need in the in the hydrogen industry, if I may call it like that, you know. And I, and I talk about skills, you know, specialized people, specialized, uh, well, engineers. And I'm trying to think about uh, when we uh, talk about wind energy and so on, we say that we are always lacking special, the, the specialized people in the numbers we need, you know, to, to work in, the, in this industry. When we talk about uh, hydrogen as, as an industry uh, that will become very soon, do you, do you think that our academic programs are uh, preparing our students to be sort of ready to work in that sector? It's a general question, eh? Yes. Any, any any thoughts that you could give me would be would be good. Well, I came from a chemical engineering background, so I'm going from chem end to doing electrical engineering now. So, I'd say if you're interested in it, go for it. Okay. <laughs> it's just a matter of learning what you want to. No, that that's nice, Emily. That's nice. So now you, yeah, is it? That's a big change, Emily. Eh? You are yeah. <laughs> Very, very, there have, been, very brave, yeah, there, have, there have been lots of discussions between transition um, of the force and um, there are plenty of the transmissible skills that you can use, you know, coming from the oil and gas nice. website to renewable. Um, but um, the problem sometimes is the willing to move really because um, oil and gas is still seen, uh, is seen by employees to be more profitable and, uh, you know, giving them better revenue and salaries compared to renewable. Okay. So, you know, one thing is whether the people are there. I think the people are there and, and I think that um, there is a workforce. The, okay. the okay. other question is how to motivate them to, to move from one sector to another sector. To the, to the other one. No, that's nice, Lubica, that's nice. We, we have a, one more a question in the forum. Maybe all, all of you can see it, you know, it's from a, Ma Ma Madud uh, Hossein, yeah. How many people you need to run a wind farm compared to oil and gas platform? Or can renewables hydrogen employ small number of oil and gas people? Hmm. Uh, wind farm are designed uh, to be uh, maintained and operated from the shore. Uh, and uh, all the models are set up to minimize uh, having a humans in such a hostile environment, especially when we are moving to to deeper water where where the weather is um, is even worse uh, compared to oil platform, for example. So that's the first big difference. Um, so you still can see people having working on the oil platforms, whereas in terms of wind farms, the idea is to build it to leave it there and to have the system in place um, and all those smart monitoring um, um, systems just yeah. to be able to, to minimize the reactive actions, but to have, you know, great monitoring system and, and to prevent any failures or, or fixing. I, yeah. I, I think just in terms of numbers, so I'm, I'm trying to off the top of my head because I did look at this a while ago that I think the UK oil and gas industry employs somewhere in the region of 300,000 people. Um, in total, and there's um, a publication that says the renewables industry in the UK over the next 10 years will be employing somewhere around 200,000 people. So there's a gap, but it's you know it's, it's the same order of magnitude. Um, but notably, there is a big gap there because we don't do much of the manufacturing in this country. Um, we don't build the turbines that we're putting in the North Sea, and that could um, change employment pictures substantially if we did a lot more of this domestically. And I know that is um, seen as a government priority, both in Westminster and Scotland. So it, we could end up in a case where um, we're not seeing, in terms of numbers, much change in the total number of employed people. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Okay, well, I, I, I think we have more, <laughs> more points for discussion, you know, but in, in the interest of time and to be uh, uh, on time, let's say, Brenda, uh, Gordon, are you happy to stop here the session or we have time for more, one more question? No? Okay. So Gordon is telling me that he's happy to stop the session here. I think that Brenda is also happy. 
So, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, presenters, thank you so much for, for an excellent uh, session. You know, the, as I said at the start of, of, the, of the session, very exciting topics and uh, and I wish you all the best uh, in your in your research, uh, Emily. All the best, Lubica, Aaron, and I'm pretty sure that uh, I will see you hopefully next year. You know, with uh, with more exciting results. Okay, so thanks again, and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye for now.